Welcome to LitFest Online. I'm Lucy Popescu and I'm chair of the Authors Club. And we set up this online festival really to help those writers who had books coming out during the lockdown and, and know where to promote them. So Christina Lamb is a war correspondent. Welcome, Christina. Thank you, Lucy. And thank you for doing this. It's such a good idea. And um, Christina's book, in our... Uh, in Our Bodies, Their Battlefields, Christina Lamb explores the lives of women in wartime and the devastating impact of rape as a weapon of war. She visits the Congo, Rwanda, Nigeria, Bosnia and Iraq and spends time with the Rohingya who had to flee Myanmar. She records the harrowing stories of survivor, survivors from Yazidi girls kept to slaves by ISIS fighters to the thousands of schoolgirls abducted, abducted across northern Nigeria by Boko Haram. Our Bodies, Their Battlefields gives these women a voice and docu undocuments the lifelong damage caused them. We've made some progress in international women's rights, but across the world, women continue to be victimized by wartime atrocities that are rarely recorded, much less punished. There have been remarkably few convictions for war rape, it's as if rape doesn't matter in the reckoning of war, only killing. In this urgent and heartbreaking study, Lamb shines a light on some of the darkest areas of human experience and offers a clarion call for change. Christina, why did you want to write a book about these atrocities? Um, it's a difficult subject and I wanted to write a book about it because in all my time of being a war correspondent and covering conflict and bad things around the world, which was more than 30 years, um, I felt, first of all, that the story of women was never properly told in war, that any accounts always focused very much on, on what the men were doing because people were much more interested in the sort of fighting or the bang bang, as I call it. Um, but the other main reason was in the last few years, I've just seen, far more brutality against women than I had seen in any of my previous years of uh, reporting. And I was shocked at the stories I was hearing and also just really baffled at why it should be getting worse. And so I decided to start investigating it much more. And it's also a difficult story to get into the newspapers because people, particularly male editors, <laughs> think it's something that's uncomfortable and they don't want to hear about. So it seemed to me that it was something that I needed to write a book about. But it must have been unimaginably hard to write. I mean, where did you begin? Well, I had already, over the last few years, I'd interviewed a lot of, so the first case really, which really brought home to me about how awful this was, um, was meeting Yazidi women who had fled, um, who'd been held as sex slaves by ISIS. And, um, and I met after they either escaped or been rescued and had been taken to Germany actually in a very innovative project by a German province, uh, Baden-Württemberg. And so more than a thousand of them had been taken to Germany. And so that was a good place to talk to people because, you know, they were in a safe setting. And, um, and so I went to speak to some of them and the stories that they told me were just so horrendous. And I had met Yazidis before in Iraq and in the refugee camps, but sitting with these often very young girls and hearing the kind of things that had happened to them. For example, a 16 year old Yazidi girl who told me about, first they were all taken to these sort of slave markets where they actually tried to make themselves look more ugly because they didn't want to be taken by the ISIS fighters. Um, but then she was taken by this fat ISIS judge and she told me that he raped her all the time but she said that the worst time of all was the night that he brought back a 10 year old girl and raped her in the room next door and this 16 year old girl said to me that that was the worst night of her life listening to that 10 year old crying for her 
mother. So these kind of stories are just so unbelievable. And as around the same time of talking a lot to the Yazidis, I was going to northern Nigeria quite a lot because the um, Chibok girls who had been taken, you might remember, it's actually six years ago now, but um, were taken in the middle of the night from their school dormitory, uh, more than 200 girls by Boko Haram fighters and taken into the forest and captured and made to be their bushwives, as they call them. Um, so I was going to northern Nigeria talking to girls who had been um, kept by Boko Haram. And I, we focused very much on the Chibok girls, but there were tens of thousands of girls that this happened to. And lastly, again, or within a couple of years, was the Rohingya women who had been in Burma, had been attacked by Burmese military, who had tied them to banana trees and gang raped them, um, often in front of their children, and sometimes killing the children. Um, and so hearing all these stories, one after another. And so then I started going from there into other places um, and talking to women. And of course, everywhere I went, I was telling people what I was doing, which then led to coming across places that I didn't know about at all. Yeah, and I mean, your research stretches from Japan's comfort women during the Second World War through the atrocities of Rwanda and the Balkans conflict. Um, how long did it take and, and what did you hope to achieve with the sort of breadth of it all? Um, how long did it take? These things are always, I always find quite hard to answer because in a way, you know, I've been talking to women about this for years in, in my reporting, but the actual time, I mean, ironically, I know exactly when I signed the contract to do the book because um, I actually thought it was something that was very much an obsession of mine and maybe other people wouldn't be interested in, but I felt like the only way to try and make a difference here was to actually tell the stories, lots of stories, to give some idea of the, the wide scale that it is, that it's not just in a few places, but all over the place. And so I was sort of traveling around doing that. But the Me Too movement um, started uh, exactly at the time that I had actually just sent out my uh, book proposal. So um, it became quite timely because there was more interest then in sort of what's happening to women. So, which was great because then it meant that I got a lot of interest in different countries for, for the book. Um, so that was, when was that? It was October 2017 uh, or 2018. Um, yeah. And, and so that, that was when I started really um, researching fully and writing it. And then it came out in March of this year. And can you talk a little bit about the way young women, they're often punished twice, first by their abusers, and then again, if they're ostracized by their family or community, and this often taints their children as well, who are rejected as bad blood? Well, this was one of the really awful things in talking to people about this, that, you know, these women are victims of something terrible that has happened to them and yet in many places they are the ones that are then blamed and ostracized and are kind of forced out of their communities and so they've already gone through this absolutely terrible ordeal um, you know maybe physically damaged and mentally damaged by this and then on top of that then they have no livelihood because they've been forced out so um you know the people that should be castigated are the people that did this not the people who su suffered it and so it's it feels like you know it's completely we've got it completely wrong and you know the clear reason and you asked me why i wanted to do it i wanted to do it because i wanted it to stop and it, i can understand why something like this was still going on in you know the year 2020 when this has been a war crime for a hundred years um, and so but clearly the main reason that it's still going on 
is first of all it is effective and cheap um, and as you know a number of people said to me it costs less than a bullet um, but also there's complete immune impunity almost nobody as you mentioned in your introduction almost nobody has been brought to justice for this so as long as that continues then you know this isn't going to stop um, for the past 10 years, I've mentored two survivors of torture. Um, we help them write about their experiences. But um, I don't have to ask them any difficult questions. They just tell me what they want and write what they want. And also, that's a relationship built up over years. Where do you begin if you've only got a matter of minutes, hours, days? You know, how do you build trust? Well, the good thing about doing it as a book was that I did have more time, you know, and these stories, I always emphasize, you know, when people are doing reporting on these kind of subjects, these stories need time. These people have been through something terrible. And if they're going to tell their story, they need to tell it in the way that they wish to tell it. And that might take a very long time. Um, I sat, you know, for days with some of the Yazidi girls in particular, listening to the stories and they wanted to tell me every single detail of of what happened um but i was of course very worried about re-traumatizing people by making them recount the most terrible thing that had ever happened to them so in a way i mean i it basically everybody i spoke to pretty much were people that had already um agreed to speak through some intermediary so whether it was a trauma therapist working in a refugee camp who was speaking to the women and then um, told them that there was this writer who wanted to do this and would they be prepared to talk or hospitals where um, they were helping women and again um, asking them. So I, I never really kind of went cold to some women and said, hey, <laughs> you know, this terrible thing's happened to you, can you tell me about it? It was always people that already knew that they were going to sit down with me. Um, of course, you know, in reporting, that doesn't always happen. I mean, when the Rohingya were coming over the border from Myanmar into Bangladesh, you know, we were asking them as they came over, what, hap what happened to you? And some of the women, well, a lot of the women had these, these terrible stories. So we were the first people that they spoke to. And that's very difficult. I have, you know, I worry about this a lot because we don't have any training as journalists in how to deal with really traumatized people. But also, as I realized in the research for this book, we can jeopardize their legal cases if they do end up going to court because if they've spoken to lots of journalists and told slightly different stories each time or it's been reported slightly differently that will undermine their case so Nadia Murad for example the well-known Yazidi woman young woman who was very bravely the first one really to sort of speak up internationally and tell her story and uh, now is a UN envoy and was um, given the Nobel Peace Prize. It would be extremely difficult for her to ever get justice for what happened to her because she's given so many interviews and, you know, it would be very easy for a defence lawyer to sort of pick that apart and say, well, you've said this on that day and this on this day. And how do you, how do you manage their expectations in, in talking to you? Well, I, I don't want to give anybody any false hope that I'm, a lot of the women that I spoke to really want, the reason they wanted to speak was because they really didn't want this to happen to anybody else. Um, and so they wanted to tell their story in the hope that it would make a difference. And I mean, it, to be honest, it's the thing I struggle most with as a journalist that, you know, I spend a lot of time interviewing people who terrible things have happened to, and I pour my heart out to try and tell their stories. But, you know, does it make a difference at the end, end of the day? And, um, you know, a lot of the time, I'm afraid you feel that it doesn't, but at least with writing this book, I felt, okay, no one could say they didn't know, right? All these stories are here from so many different countries on such a big scale. And it's no good just saying, oh, well, there's always been rape in war. Yes, there has, but I mean, aren't we better than that? Isn't it time to say, well, actually, it's not acceptable. This shouldn't be happening 
to women. And almost all of the women that I interviewed said to me, I wish I'd died, that this was worse living with this than if I'd been killed. But in your view, why is systematic rape not routinely being treated as a war crime? I think partly what I just said, that some people just say, oh, well, it, it's always happened. Um, I think it's always treated at the end of a war as if it's not the main issue, that what really matters is the, the killing. And so, I, I mean, an example of that is the, the lots of ISIS fighters have been captured and are in jails in, in Iraq and Syria. And I went to some of the, the trials in Iraq, which, you know, is a justice, not quite as we know it. Uh, the, the cases are very quick, you know, like 20 minutes and somebody's been given a death sentence. But um, all of the cases were on terrorism charges. So and then I spoke to the chief judge and said, haven't any of these people held Yazidis as captives? And he said, oh yeah, lots of them. So I said, well, why aren't you trying anybody for that? And he said, he just was baffled. He laughed at me. He said, why would we try for that? These people were also killing, and that's worse. So there's a lack of understanding. Mm. I think that's largely because you know, a lot of these forums are still dominated by men. And so negotiations at the end of wars, just as at the end of the Second World War, you know, we had international tribunals, we had the Tokyo Tribunal, we had the Nuremberg, and nobody was um, tried for these things, even though there were millions of cases. So, um, you know, th through history, this has been the pattern. And I think we should be better than that now. But the other reason too is that in some of these places for example the democratic republic of congo drc the very people carrying out these atrocities are the people running the country or who are in the army or police or militias that are dominating local areas so the idea that a woman could go and try and get justice from people that are, are still wandering around patrolling the place with ak-47s is really difficult that being said, some incredibly brave women have gone to court. And um, is that why the De Democratic Republic of Congo, it's today dubbed the rape, cap rape capital of the world. Why is it so appalling there? Um, is it down to impunity or, or something else? Well, uh, above all impunity, but, and there are people, there are some brave people trying to change that. Um, but the general climate is one of allowing these things to happen. Um, but also, I'm afraid that, I mean, one of the reasons in GRC is its own mineral wealth. That it has so many of the things that we really want, not least um, what we need for mobile phones and for batteries of electric cars, um, the cobalt for that is these things are incredibly valuable. So the militias want to control the areas where they are. And the easiest way to do that is to um, force the villagers out or intimidate them. And an extremely effective way of doing that is to rape the women because then you humiliate the men that feel they can't protect their women. Um, you decimate the society and um, people flee. And um, can you talk a little bit more about art, writing, gardening as forms of therapy for many abused women you met? Yes, I mean, a, a particular thing that people seem to find very helpful was to to kind of go back to the earth and um, whether it's women of Srebrenica in um, Bosnia who started growing roses. Um, and that's kind of a sweet story because one of the therapists helping them um, thought that this might help them and she ordered um, from a, or got funding from a Dutch project and they sent a lot of roses to grow but then when the women grew them in their gardens they liked them so much being there with the smell of the roses that they didn't cut them and the whole idea had been to give them a livelihood <laughs> and so she had to get lots more and now they do sell as well um, but what well, also, one of the things I found in writing this book, there is no single organization in the world that deals with sexual violence in conflict. So lots of aid agencies have people working on it, but there isn't one 
organization just doing that worldwide, which means that there's not that much sharing of information. And so I would find, you know, I'd go to DRC where there's an amazing project, City of Joy, run by this incredible woman, Christine Schuler, um, to help women who have um, been raped and gone through really terrible things. And, and it's a, she, she takes them for six months to help them kind of find themselves again and find a way to um, well, actually to tell their story too, but also to have a livelihood and um, get them on their feet. And it was just the most amazing place, actually, very inspirational. But she was she's just quite recently bought a farm as well for them to work on. And she was saying how um, helpful that is, that she's found that they really um, somehow the healing power of nature. Um, and I just thought that's really, it's lovely, but in a way, you know, it's taken her 10 years or more of doing the project to come to that. And, and yet the women in Bosnia, who also took like 10 years to come to that, but that was more than 10 years ago. So had they all been in touch, she might have started doing that earlier on. Um, so definitely that is, seems to be one of the most helpful art. I mean, in the refugee camps, um, arts used quite effectively, like with some of the Yazidi women. Um, and, but the advantage of the farming and the growing of things is, you know, one of the important things is for them to become self-sufficient and have a livelihood. Um, so that is important. But I think, you know, us in lockdown are all seeing that, gardening is something that is helpful um, as is baking i'm just That's very right. excited my next question. what does the war correspondent <laughs> do during lockdown i have to say i just came home from the supermarket waving a pack of self-releasing flour excitedly i never thought i would get excited <laughs> by that um yes baking cakes um it's not easy to be i mean obviously it's not easy for anybody under lockdown and i, I, I actually um I think war correspondence is very difficult because my whole career I've always been jumping on a plane to go somewhere and I've never stayed in one place for very long and then suddenly I'm here I can't go anywhere and it's frustrating too because I see we are so focused on what's happening in our country and not surprisingly because it's terrible what's happening but you know the world hasn't stopped there's still things terrible things happening there's still wars going on um and there are a lot of people you know whose health systems just cannot cope with this at all there are countries like somalia that don't have a single ventilator or you know countries that um like south sudan that have like 12 um intensive care beds so if they get this on a big scale you know they they just don't have the means to to deal with it at all so it concerns me that you know we're not maybe focusing on that enough and also um i'm seeing in a lot of places where there are autocratic rulers people really taking advantage of the situation. I mean, somebody said to me, dictators love lockdowns and mm. it's perfect for autocratic rulers to be able to, you know, crack down on the press, to arrest their opponents, to do all sorts of things that, so we're seeing that happening quite a lot. So I am concerned that we still cover some of these things, but actually, um, I've been mostly reporting on my own country and city for the first time in my career, really. And so like this week, I was talking to bus drivers in London about the risks that they're taking, because it turns out that as a percentage, more bus drivers are dying than any other section, sector of the, the society. Um, it worries me a bit that we get these figures every day, six, seven hundred people dying and we're just mm. accepting it. I mean, this is mm. like 10 times a Grenfell fire or a 7-7 bombing. And, um, and we, they've become numbers. We don't know the stories of the people. And I, my whole career has been about, you know, the power of a story, telling people's stories. And so trying to find, you know, just to remind people, the individuals behind this. One of the bus drivers that I wrote about who, was, who died a week ago, and his daughter was telling me about how he loved poetry and playing the guitar and 
and going for cream teas. You know, it just brings home that these this is individuals with who had everything ahead of them and the whole f how tragic it is for their families. Yeah, well, I'm afraid we're out of time, but thank you very much for giving, giving us some insights into your book. It is a terrific book. I urge people um, to, to read it as soon as possible. But Christina, thank you very much. Thanks, Lucy. Great to talk to you.